Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to the Catapult Lockdown Virtual Salon Program. My name is Alim Hussein, and I'm speaking with you from a bright and sunny Guyana. This afternoon, I'll be in discussion with Neros Walker from the island of St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Before we begin, on behalf of everyone, I'd like to express huge thanks to the Catapult partners, including the American Friends of Jamaica, Kingston Creative, and Fresh Milk for making this exciting series of programs possible. Remember, please feel free to ask your questions in the comments section during the talk, and we'll answer them in the question and answer segment of the salon. As I said this afternoon, it is my honor and pleasure to be talking with Neros Walker. It is my honor to now introduce Neros and welcome her to the program. Thank you, Aline. It's a pleasure to be here today. Hi, Neros. Hi. Nice to be talking with you. Mm -hmm. How are you? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm good. Are you? It's exciting to be You're here. Ready? Um, I'm ready. And before we start anything, I need to give a shout out to my friend Monica Marin. She told me not to do it, but. Without her, this would not have been happening right now. So, hey, man, Monica, thank you. I know she's watching right now. Great, hello, Monica. Thanks for joining and thanks for getting near us hooked up with this program. Now, near us um, is a visual artist. She's an art educator. She's a curator. She's had a long and exciting history in art. Uh, she is a committed educator and a very talented artist. She has a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree and also a Master's in Art Education. So you can see that she is well prepared and well rounded. So near us, um, there are many things that you know we can talk about today, um, but one of the things that I was interested in is your location in St. Croix. Um, my wife and I had the pleasure of visiting St. Thomas and St. John uh, some time ago, and we could see the similarities between your islands and the rest of the Caribbean. Um, but, you know, the St. Croix is part of the U.S. Virgin Islands, and it has some different political connections. So I would like to start there and talk a little bit about your location as an artist in St. Croix. I know you are originally from Dominica, but you've been living most of your life in St. Croix. We will come to your art journey a little later. But what is it like to be living and working as an artist in St. Croix? Um, what is the kind of support and institutions and galleries and so on that are there available to you to to assist you in your work and, and give you your creative um, space to outlet your creative um, work. Wow, uh, there's a lot to, to say about that. For for us artists working in Sankara, I can only speak from my perspective. And uh, you can hear me well, yeah? Yes. And Okay, and um, as an artist, I feel like I have been supported on Sankara by my community. Um, a lot of, I know a lot of I've been teaching for so long, and I know a lot of people, a lot of students. However, as far as institutional support, um, we don't really have such institutions here. We don't have, a, say, like a fine arts major at our university. There is no percent for art program here. There's no Ministry of Culture and Art to help um, support and scaffold artists uh, and young and up and coming artists here. I've met a lot of people through the years who want me to teach them, to help them, even as recently as last week. Um, this young man who um, who spent some time incarcerated found you know, the arts through that form and he really wants to grow his practice. He wants to learn more, but there is no place for him to go and learn that. And so this is sorely lacking here. However, the one thing that's good here is we have a lot of galleries. You can, um, I've been affiliated with galleries here from pretty much the start. Uh, we have galleries such as Top Hat, who's 
you know, really been a, a, a great place for me to show and showcase my work and to do shows or curate exhibition. Mike Walsh Art Gallery was one of the first places that that really supported my art and, and me uh, showing art. The Caribbean Museum Center for the Arts that was founded by Candia Atwalker is probably the only place where that's dedicated to the arts specific only um, uh, where you can go, you can take some classes, you can, you know, bring we bring in other artists from different places to um, to exhibit and so on. And yeah, so as far as like financial support, we have it's a very small um, pool. We have the Virgin Islands Council on the Arts from where you can, you can write grants and there's a college, uh, the Community Foundation of Virgin Islands. But it's, it's, uh, the, that's really the only two in major areas um, specifically dedicated to, to arts and humanities for artists on St. Croix. Yeah. So do you have like among artists, do you meet, do you discuss, do you have fora and so on? Um, unfortunately, no. I, I think a lot of artists here work in isolation. Uh, I'm not possibly, I can't really uh, testify to why that is. It possibly could be because we do have, a lot of us possibly have day jobs. I'm not sure there's many artists here who are full-time working artists, uh, living and working from and making, you know, sustainable life from their artwork. And um, yeah, uh, I, it's just one of the things though that I did over the COVID is that I started a program called Take 5BI on YouTube where I okay, try to yes. bring, uh, you know, you take that isolation away by interviewing local artists and um, promoting <laughs> them and their work. And I also, uh, so out of that, the idea came for starting salons like old size salons where artists could meet and discuss. It is not that we don't, but it's sort of like you meet somebody and say, yeah, you start talking about the arts because you have that in common, but there is no no real formal gathering of artists to, to help build each other in that art community like that. Yeah. Okay. Tell um, us tell us more about Take 5. I saw something about it. Uh, Take 5 VI. Tell us how, tell us more about it. <laughs> How it's how you got the idea to start it, what it does, and what activities you've been doing, and so on. So I wanted to do something different. I wanted to use my time. Um, other, I was painting, of course, but I wanted to use my time to do something else. I thought it was a perfect opportunity during the lockdown to learn a new skill. Um, I was also taking some online mentoring courses for my art and ways in which to market and promote my art. But, and, and learning, so I decided um, to, to, to just reach out to, to do that. That was one of the, the problems we had to solve was to find ways to reach, to the, reach out to the community. So I decided to um, call, call it Take 5 VI, because initially it was supposed to be just a five minute you know, snippet of an artist's okay. life. And some, some of them are up to 15 minutes. Because okay. there's a lot to say, and, and these artists have a lot of beautiful mm -hmm. work, and you know I think mm -hmm. it's important to to share um, mm -hmm. what we have here together as a community. It's such a small community, Elim here, and and again our resources are so scarce that it sometimes it's, it's, it's hard to, to want to share that because if you if if, a, if, if an organization has ten thousand a hundred thousand dollars to give out, that's, mm -hmm. and and you know the maximum you can get is say ten thousand. You know, that's ten people. If everybody, if they really, you know, if if your proposal yes. was warranting ten thousand, and and yeah. that's not a lot, so yeah, it makes it a little competitive. But I think, I think um, we collaborate perhaps on smaller levels, uh, collaboration to do uh, curating, to bring artists down to presentations, things like that. Okay, so how many persons have been have hooked up with the Take Five? Uh, about eleven so far. Yeah, okay, 11, and these and these are persons who are Crucians who are who have been doing art uh, basically on their own or so on for some time. Yeah, um, I have interviewed a seasoned artists who've been working for as long as me or longer, and and new artists who just started this journey, and mm. not just Crucians, um, and Tomians and Jonians. Yeah. 
just the whole okay, Virgin Islands. Okay. I mean, I don't know all the artists the that they haven't taken off yet. Yes, mm -hmm. it's the whole yes. VI. Like yes. I want to, yes. I want to promote the Virgin Islands. It's it's unfortunate as much as we are a colony, <laughs> a territory of the United States, we are we are almost almost invisible to to the bigger mainland um, issues. Uh, we don't get the same support like we were talking institutional support earlier. That's you know that comes vicariously through VICA through the federal government grants that is disseminated through the government that individuals don't have that opportunity a lot of the time. There is a for example, there was a grant that I felt I qualified for as far as my artwork and my education and my experience. But because I was not residing on the mainland, I was told I couldn't oh. qualify for it. And that was the oh. sole disqualification. Okay, you know? I see. Yes. So it's important that you start some energy in in the islands themselves that you can exactly. support your work. I, right. I'm very glad to hear about Take 5. That's a very, very, ex you. very good idea. Yes. So now talk. we can talk about your journey from Dominica to St. Croix. Um, okay. when, when did you and how did you realize your artistic talent? Um, were you a creative child? Uh, <laughs> were you, or, or did you have an epiphany at some moment or did you discover it while you were going to school or how did this happen? Um, there are several points along that journey that brought me here. Uh, I remember if I was to go way back, when I grew up in Dominica, um, we have rivers, you know, it's the land of many rivers, and you can find clay by the riverbed. And I would grab clay and I would make mud mud houses and get little okay. broken glass and make windows. And I would use feathers from parrots and build things because they were so beautiful. And um, so that was my first, my earliest memory of uh, positive um, steps towards art making. When I moved to St. Croix, I had a, an art teacher um, who uh, taught me how to draw the face. And I think that was another pivotal moment where I realized that I really had the skill, at least. And I, and I, I really loved it. But being a homebody, I, I wasn't... St. Croix for me was such a different place. Dominica, I could run around, I could go to the rivers, I climbed trees. I, you know, you walk, you walk to school, you walk everywhere, in, either in groups or even alone, it was safe enough that you could do that. But here, once we got here, I got here at 11, 11 years old or so, it was like lockdown. <laughs> you couldn't go anywhere unless you had somebody in the car to take you. So okay. I was pretty much isolated a lot at home. After school, you know, you go home and you're there. And so that's how my artistic journey kind of began is being home and getting involved in it. But I'll say that I would be an artist regardless. If it wasn't visual, it would be, I would be a writer or some other form of art because that's just where my heart is and always has been. I like drawing from the television. Never drew from Bob Ross, okay. but there were other people on PBS okay. who would show art, art programs and I would practice after them. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And, and uh, your, your family, uh, members of your family, do they also have this creative drive or are you a unique child in the family? No, no. I think my father was an artist in his own way. He was a carpenter and he mm -hmm. built our mm -hmm. houses from scratch and he'd build furniture from scratch. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, he didn't have the design aesthetics, but he had the skill. And in some cases he did, he would make curved legs and, and so on. And um, he didn't have the education, and and even in Dominica, I like I didn't know about clay, I didn't know about ceramics, I didn't know what I was doing. You know, we put it in the sun, it get hard, it broke, it was temporal. So I never knew that, you know, because and also when I grew up in the '70s, you know, we drank out of tin cups or plastic cups. So ceramic, you know, we weren't right. like rich, so we didn't know. I didn't know yeah. ceramics. So, um, but then I have cousins uh, in Dominica and the United States who are artists. Yeah. So I think it comes, at least from what I can see from my father's side. Yes, so there, there is something in the family. Yes. Yeah. And it's interesting what you said about your father because we have so many creative persons who work with their hands. Because in the Caribbean, we, well, it's a bit changing now, but we make, we make our things. We used to make our furniture. We right. used to make our clothes and all of that. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, now we, we we buy those things in a in a nice uh, shiny store. <laughs> so we are we are losing yeah. all of that. In in yeah. Guyana, the, the 
what the first generation of local artists, many of them were sign painters, you know, they were painting signs for businesses. Mm -hmm. And but so they had the, the, the use of color and shape and form and lettering. But nobody thought about it as art until persons yeah. began training and, and working with them. So so I'm, I'm glad that your art is actually grounded in practices of the, the Caribbean. So which which serves as a nice segue into your teaching. Um, okay. So were you always art interested in being an art teacher or no. was it no, no. something that you discovered? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I went to art school, yeah. It. Yeah, yeah. Um, I went to art school because I wanted to not have a nine to five grind. I honestly wanted to paint, you know, be the kind of person sit up till three in the morning painting. And I have done it. Oh. Wake up at 10 in the next morning or whatever. I just wanted to have this free schedule. Um, but the student loans got in the way. <laughs> okay. okay. And uh, I, I, but also when I came home, I realized that it was uh, art education and art community from my perspective in my com in my sub community because you know like like your community i'm sure there are many sub communities and there were galleries in christianstead um i live in frederickstead and i grew up in frederickstead uh but there were galleries on the east side but i didn't feel connected to that i didn't even know there were galleries before i left and went to college honestly when i came back from college it's when I really started to think about the art community here and uh, the education here. And having had that art teacher who really inspired me, uh, I decided I would look to teach art. And I didn't like, intend to stay. As a matter of fact, a good friend of mine said, don't get stuck teaching. Okay, but yes. I'm, I've back. been stuck for 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> and you've been enjoying it. Yeah, I, I really do. I, I really enjoy it. Uh, you know, you know who are nobody enjoys like administrative bureaucratic red tape. But as far as teaching art and exposing the students to art and having them experience that, yeah, that's a that's an enjoyable journey. And it, it was a calling. You don't stay in teaching for twenty five years if you're not called to do it. Yeah, yeah. But well, let's talk about that then. So, what is your approach to art education? Um, is it is art something that you can teach? And what is it that you try to get over to your students? And I know I'm asking a lot of questions. And, and okay. what is it you try to get them to do? So basically, what is your philosophy of art education? You, you have a master's in art education. Mm -hmm. Does that play a role in what you do? Or is your art training more natural from the body? So what is your approach to art education? Uh, so... When I first started teaching, I, I think I was stumbling. I was teaching sort of the way I was taught in college. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like I wasn't doing it right. So that's why I went to get master's. But it turned out I was doing it right. <laughs> because it pretty much taught me what I was already doing. Um, so I just had to do it. with felt like I, the master's gave me more confidence to do what I, what I know, what I wanted to do. And so what my job is, I think, is to teach students the value the art, to, to see it, observe it, and notice it in their lives and in their environment. And one of the things that this lockdown has done for us and the COVID um, stay in place is that our students are now learning art online and I really had a hard time trying to figure out how I was gonna teach art online. 25 years of teaching, 26 years, uh, 24 years of teaching like, you know, in a brick and mortar space and now I have to teach it online. and. I know the difficulties that I encountered, you know, face to face. So I was, I was a little bit concerned about teaching online. But what I did was realize I had them go into their home and find art objects, or objects of art, and help them to recognize that around their space that there is art, and that art constitutes so many different things. And it's not just drawing and painting and uh, and sculpture. It, I need, it, I need to, my biggest challenge is to change their mindset about what the arts are and to get them interested in either in a learning it, supporting it. I, I don't go out to try to make artists. I try to make art knowers, art lovers. Okay. Would you say then it's, it's more a question of orientation and attitude rather than technical skill? 
Well, you know, I teach adolescents for the most part, and that's where they're at. They want to be able to draw well. They want to draw what they think is, their, you know, they're steeped in more realism. So there is that part of it. Uh, I, I've been out of school for a while as far as, like, learning the new techniques of, the, of, of education, art education, although I am sometimes part of the National Art Education Association. I do try to create some kind of combination of uh, discipline-based art education with creative expression and visual culture. Uh, so, so that those that's how I, I how you say, structure my curriculum, because part of that lack of institutional support is that we have no art curriculum here for okay. Virgin Islands art teachers. So, mm. any art teacher, any theater or drama teacher have to make their own curriculum, and there is some freedom in that, but sometimes it, it, it's that it's a lot of work. Mm. Yes. Okay. So I think I think I read somewhere that um, as a teacher, you also were responsible for selecting uh, students' work to be exhibited at a young artist exhibition annually. Oh yeah. Um, after my masters, oh well, at least while I was getting my masters, I went to the National Art Education Association conference, which is a, a large conference in the United States for art teachers, uh, retirees, um, any anyone in any educator, art educator in the arts at any level. And I learned about the Youth Art Month program because it's supported by the National Art Education Association. So I came home in 2006 and just started it. Yeah, I just initiated the Youth Art Month program and. It's a matter of coordinating uh, all the different schools together and art teachers. And even sometimes we didn't, I would do uh, non-art teachers. If, uh, like when my children were in kindergarten, they didn't have an art teacher, but they, you know, the kindergarten teacher did art with them. So we did their, we you know, we'd, uh, display their artwork. Yeah. So why, why do you, first of all, do you think that everybody has a kind of creative part of their nature. Um, but this is something that the education system suppresses or growing up suppresses. I think both things have a part to play in that. I think uh, many factors. The education system, I don't know that they deliberately suppress it, but they do not provide opportunity for it to grow. Uh, the focus is, you know, to make the core English, math, science, history, um, and as far as the, the society, sometimes economic conditions make it, you know, it, it's there's sort of like this tacit thing of like the starving artist, and we even have a, 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 a how you say, like a workshop, uh, you know, a time when people go to this little thing to sell, and it's called a starving artist. So this this moniker just um, it's pervasive here in, in people thinking artists starve, artists don't have to make money, you know, you don't want to do that. You want to be a doctor, a lawyer. You want to, you want to do right. those kinds of things. Yes. Those things are supported. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So one more question before we go to look at some of your own artwork. Um, why is it important to release this creative energy? in persons, in your students, even though they might not end up being artists? Why is it important to expose them to art and to, as you said, try to get them to this kind of orientation and realization of art around them? Uh, let's see, art, I think a human being is made of three parts, like your body, soul, and spirit. I think art feeds the spirit. If you don't feed your spirit, then your soul is dead. That's that's my take on it. And okay. also, art is communication. It's a form of communication. So, of course, I, when I teach my students, I first I ask them what art is, and they always say drawing and painting. And ultimately, I have to let them know it's a form of communicating. So we read art a lot of what I do. How we read visual imagery. Mm -hmm. I teach them how to, to see the messages in, um, this is Indigenous Cultures Month, so we just finished a whole series on Native Americans, how you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, West African and uh, Australian Aboriginal Australian work. And unfortunately, I mean, each one of these requires an entire semester on its own. But at the very least, right. I introduced them to that. I introduced them to how these, these uh, Indigenous cultures use the arts to communicate 
to feed their spiritual lives because a lot of the art was for, for ceremony and for spiritual um, reasons, rituals, rites, and community and family building, roles of society and so on, roles of, of peaceful persons in society. So I try to get them to, I, I do it because I think it, they need to feed their spirit. They need to recognize what they're being fed as well because as an artist, you're part sociologist, part psychologist, part historian, you know, all of these things come into your artwork. And so it, it broadens your horizons to be able to engage with the art in meaningful ways. Yes, thanks. I know I said I had one more, but there's another question that occurred to me. It, does your teaching influence your artwork? Does your artwork influence your teaching? Or, or are you able to keep these two separate separate compartments in your life? I think it's impossible to keep them separate. A lot of the times I will have an idea and that will be, that will uh, turn into a lesson plan for my students. Uh -huh. But in terms of when I get them to try to execute it, then I learn I learn ways. So as an artist, sometimes you're intuitive and you do things intuitively. But when you have to teach it to someone, you have to break it down into steps. What do you do first? What do you do next? You know, uh, if you're creating a collage. You need to lay your background first because, you know, to cut around your, your already laid down images, is going to be problematic. So, I mean, you could do it. And, and I'm sure other people have different techniques, but there's some more efficient ways to get and make art. So... Yes, teaching does indeed um, affect, inform my work. I've learned a lot because I do a lot of research for teaching. And like I said, part of the National Art Education Association is going to, going to conferences and learning from other, um, a, lot of teach, a lot of the teachers are artists themselves and they have practices. So yeah, I mean, if, you know, the basic answer is yes, it, it works both okay. ways. Great, okay. So we can, move into a discussion of some of your work. Um, you, you are basically a, a, a creative painter. Um, you work basically in paints and colors, is that right? I, I paint and I, I do some sculpture and I draw. Yes. I, I, it, it's, right. I do many different things because of an art teacher. I teach pastels, I teach acrylics, I teach uh, drawing. Uh, I don't teach oils because the uh, the environment is not suitable for teaching oil paint in my in my in my classroom. But so okay. I I feel like I need to be adept at the very least in in different media. So yeah, I yeah, I do those different ones. There are times they require sometimes something you want to say does not require a painting. Sometimes it requires a quick movement of of a pencil or or Conti uh, crayon or, or even marker. So yeah, I try to use different media for different things. Okay. So the first piece that we're going to look at is the drawing of a young man. And um, mm -hmm. that is lined up as number one. Okay. And uh, while it's coming up, you said, right, there it is. Now you so yes. talk us through this. Um, you said it's, it was from a series uh, yes. entitled Memory and Experience. So yeah. when was <laughs> this series? Yeah, when was the series done and um, what is this showing us? Okay, so um, I call this, this series Memory and Experience because it, it has to do with my experience, a, a, a specific experience I had last year that brought me to, rec to try and think about what it is I do with my art, why I do the art that I do, and uh, because some, you know, sometimes you don't have the words to express how you're feeling. And art is just such a remarkable way of talking about what's important to you. Um, <laughs> this work, uh, so I, I, I was recently, that last year when, when I started this, I, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And oh. I, I realized that, uh, you know, nothing, nothing forces you to, to reevaluate your your life and how you engage with your community or your people or your family than, than something that, that makes you face your mortality, such as cancer. And I'm not sure that I was terrified or scared. I just, it's just that all of a sudden I realized there were some things I wasn't really paying attention to. 
And even if I, I, I paid attention to the specific students within my classroom, there's a ton of students outside and the way they, they engage with each other and the way they move, all of a sudden, life, I saw the life in them, I saw the vibrancy of youth in them. And, um, and it's not like I hadn't even made sketches of students before. But I started to look at them, you know, more closely as uh, other than just looking at a group of students and seeing the patterns of your uniforms or whatever. I started to look at them more individually, the individual mannerisms, the way they stood, the way they, they, they laughed, the way they, you know, two girls might hug each other because you're good friends or help each other out. So this, this is where this came from. And I realized, too, that maybe I would not be able to go back to teaching. And mind you, every year I'm quitting teaching. But when I re when when it came down to where I may have had to quit, it was like, wow, I haven't really put enough, you know. And then COVID's not helping because after last year, now we have COVID, so I'm not even around right. my students physically. So it, 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 I'm glad I started the series because it it helped me to really pay attention to my students as individuals. And um, yeah, it, it the second thing is that I needed to complete some work very quickly. Some of the work I do is very deep. It takes me a long time to do it. Also, I was uh, I had surgery, so I was at home and I couldn't really do anything major. And these works were were um, I I did these works actually I didn't even I'm sorry I, let me backtrack a little bit. I I started those like in the, in January, but then they become they became so much more. Uh, important for me um, as as a way to make lots of work very quickly because who knows, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is an interesting thing because it's from your own um, from your own body as a human being, and you found uh, there was this dreaded thing that was happening. And it made you look out to the real world around you and to try to put that down in a tangible form. Yeah. So it's a recording there for memory, but it's exactly. a very personal personal record. record right, and it's yes. my experience that I wanted to maintain. Uh, the other thing that I learned that same year was that <laughs> I have ADHD. Or, and, okay. and I was like, <laughs> and for the first time, my, my I, me, I made sense to me, you know, what was going on in my head, why I couldn't remember things. and. Uh, why do I, you know, forget things that were even important to me? And um, it, 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 I, I'm a teacher, and I teach students with special needs. But they don't always tell you what, when you get the IEP, they don't always tell you what the special need is. They just tell you this child needs this right. modification. So uh -huh. I, I may not have recognized that, that in me because I had never seen a definition of it that, or even... Right. You know, to make that correlation, if you will. But um, yeah, I had I have a daughter who was having some issues, and I started researching. And then once once I once I had to go see doctors and so on, I had to speak with psychologists and psychiatrists because you know, with cancer, your know, the, the facility I went to, they uh, you know they deal with the whole body or you know, the whole mind and soul and spirit. And I learned that there. So okay. the, the yes. memory and the experience. And so I, I basically covered everything I do is memory and experience. And the other pieces we look at still have to do with memory and experience. They may become part of a different named series, but the whole premise of it is that we have generational memories and general experiences that, are, that trickle down to us and we may behave in certain ways or act in certain ways that we're not necessarily directly um, caused by our direct experience, but are indirectly affected through our, or, you know, our parents, our grandparents, or great grandparents. You know? Okay, yeah. and and memory is a very important concept in the Caribbean um, because we have to go back over history and beyond history, and beyond what we were taught taught about our history to to really find ourselves. So yeah. your journey is, is also like a Caribbean journey and experience. Um, Absolutely. You mentioned, I don't know anything else. Yes, yes of course. Uh, you mentioned your, your ADHD. Um, mm -hmm. When you look back, when you discover that you had that, you look back at your work. Yeah. Do you, do you find that that had an impact on your work and how you worked? 
well, one of the things is that I, I could never like focus for a really long time. Like I do one thing and I get bored with it and I need to move on to something else. And I want to try something else. And I think I can do all of these different things, but you just can't Nemo. <laughs> you have to stick to the thing you can do. You have to stick to stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, so uh, I still cannot like necessarily, I don't like to say cannot, I don't necessarily have one specific style that you can recognize as my work, but I will work within a series a style for a long series. So maybe 10, 20 pieces will look like this thing. And then I'll move on to a different subject matter. So I work in watercolors. I have a watercolor series. The drawings is a different kind of thing. So you couldn't, you wouldn't be able to identify me from the drawings compared to the watercolors compared to, you know, whatever is in between that. So I think that has something yeah. to do with it, but it's something that I have embraced. And a good friend of mine, she said to me, just whatever your weakness is, make it your strength. Correct. Great. Mm -hmm. Great. So let's look at an, another piece of work. Um, this is uh, when life gives you lemons. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so uh, we could, that involves some imageries about slavery and vanitas. Right. So impermanence. These were, yeah. Yes. Right. So you know when you it's it's ironic when I did this work. This was about the time I, I was I was diagnosed and. So it took me a long time to make this work. I had started to write my, my statement, artistic statement, uh, as a looking at the world and the temporality of things in the world and where do we put our, our focus. I had done a, an art exhibition uh, titled Anatomy of an Heirloom. And, and the thoughts came to me, what, what did we get? What have we gotten from colonialism? What, what are the residual effects of colonialism that still affects us today. And I thought about the, you know, the European lust for, for wealth and for power. And I like drawing still lifes because I'm very technically driven. I, I love the beautiful, technically drawn um, imagery. I love skulls. I have quite a collection of skulls. So. Okay. Um, oh, skulls. Every, Yes, everything in the work, in this work, I, I, except for the, the harmonica I, I own. So I thought, I really like the Vanitas. I've always liked it. And the Vanitas is, is a Flemish, a Dutch uh, a genre of creating still lives that talk about the temporality of life and not to put focus on things, but to look for more spiritual ways of existence. And I thought that, you know, all of the, and, but it, at the same time, it would be saying, hey, look at all this fun stuff we have, you know, how did they, how did they get all these things that they put in their, in their vanitas, you know, it was through trade and a lot of times through the slave trade. So, and sometimes a vanitas would have an image of a person or a photograph of a person in it. So I decided to, to kind of question that and, and try to turn it around and say, look, yeah, you have all these great and wonderful things. And yes, you knew life was temporal, but what did you do to get all those things? You know, how did you hurt and enslave people to get all of those uh, that this, uh, wealth that you have acquired and this power that you um, lost for? So this is a questioning of that whole history and ideology. Yes. Yes, yes, and which fits into a European tradition, but is also extremely relevant to the Caribbean. Right, and I try to interpose Caribbean things in it, in a sense that things that we're used to, like the pan, the, the, the jug, you know, the, you were the blue, blue one, you were... The blue, and, the blue and, mug, yes. Yes, and then the, uh, the, the lamp, right? The lamp that's there. Right. And, the skeleton and you, yeah, your medium here is it uh, paint? Yes, my my my. Yeah, I like painting in oils best. Yes, yeah, so this is an oil painting with uh, a wax overlay, and then I put mm -hmm. I, I superimpose some silhouetted images on top of that. Mm -hmm. The the wax overlay is very interesting because there was a technique called encaustic. 
mm. that the ancient Egyptians used to practice. Um, yeah. Is that what you you're doing? So yeah, I because again, this is where the you know being a teacher totally um, influences my art. I get periodicals and magazines, and I would yes. read them. And there was this. That's when I was introduced to encaustic medium. And I always wanted to do it, but I was a little bit intimidated by using of the wax and all of that. But one day I just decided to try because I really wanted to move away from just the basic one layer of painting. I wanted to create some layering and some depth. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, and some depth in my work, not just uh, uh, how you say, not just in terms of the meaning, but in terms of the actual physical uh, the image surface. Yes. Yeah. And so I decided to try and caustic. As a matter of fact. <laughs> The piece behind me uh, that you see a little, a little corner of it there uh, to my uh, right, yeah, is uh, as an encaustic piece. But oh, I prefer, mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. with the flags in the corner. I, I prefer mm -hmm. to use the overlays because, and I may, that may or may not make encaustic again. I mean, I have all the materials, but it's, again, it's right. what am I trying to say and what medium fits that, fits that. story best, yes. Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, we will go to one other piece and then we will take some questions from the audience. Okay. Um, so you had the quadrille pieces, right. uh, which involve the, the fabrics and the dancing and the dress uh, that women will wear. And you also have a concept of women yes. as the bridges of culture. Yeah. So we can look at the three graces, the quadrille. Um, you have a red one and a blue one. Uh, we can go, okay. No, that's another oh. Vanitas image, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So that Vanitas concept is very important in your work. Yeah, it's very important because I think we need to consider our mortality. We need to consider how we live in this world. We need to consider uh, where we put our, our, our focus and our values. And yes. But at the same time, again, like I said, you know, we need to consider, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're saying, if you're looking after things, you know, on why, yes. why? Why, correct. Okay, right. This is a great one. Yes. Mm, thank you. Okay. Yes. So why did you do this piece and when was this done? So this, the whole series of Women Alone, which is an uh, exhibition that will be opening at a new gallery, and I'll actually be the first uh, person in that show. My, my, my show will open the gallery, basically. Um, it's called Kenwood Gallery. Yeah, thank you. It's uh, my friend, Sonia Dean, she, who is, who is uh, an avid collector of my work. So uh, we have a really great relationship. This one is called Sisters. And it, I wanted to do, between the, the Vanitas pieces, I wanted to do some, because the Vanitas are very deep, they're heavy, they, they're painful to make sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, because I know some, a lot of times we have this misnomer, and I try to take that away from that. Art is like frivolous and it's fun. Oh, so, you know, it can be cathartic. And I've made cathartic art, but it's not always mm -hmm. that way. And mm -hmm. so these pieces were, that moment where I wanted to be a little bit free and not not be so bogged down in in the in the story of you know this society and, and all the things that are that are right. wrong with it. And also I wanted to show that black people, people of color, can come together. You see this is a lighter skinned lady. I think right. she might be Hispanic and a darker skinned lady and come together and we have fun. Our lives are not always about being, coming from re, from enslavement. You know, we, although the quadrille is obviously, you know, derived from the waltz, we have made it our own, we have embraced it. And how right. have we, like the last piece called When Life Give You Lemons. We've taken the lemon and we've made lemonade and it's our lemonade and we sweeten it how much we want, yeah. okay? So in a sense, that's sort of what that is. It's also, I think we are in a wave of where women are beginning to come into their own and we're beginning to, to you know, stand up more for, for our womanhood. And I think we need to make sure that as we do that, we take each other along with us and we embrace each other and, ha and enjoy life too, you know. Yes, great. And that madrasi fabric has a long colonial history. 
and right. also a history where they, the women took it and made it something to express their own freedom exactly. and, and their own personalities. And, and Madras yes, is very important to the St. Croix community. Uh, I mm -hmm. believe that they are, they are right now working on designing their own Madras pattern. And it, okay. it's, a, it's such a beautiful and graceful kind of thing to watch the ladies dance. And I mean, ladies don't, you know, they, they have, there's obvious, uh, obviously men in, in the quadrille, but the, part, the, the way that they, you know, like I had a friend uh, on my Take Five uh, episode who talked about the movement uh, of mm -hmm. the, the dresses, but I didn't want to, the typical art you might see of Madras is very tight where the pattern is so important. And for me, it wasn't the pattern that was important. It was the women being bearers of culture, the women carrying on the tradition. Uh, because a lot of the times they won't have enough men in, in the, in the quadrille group and women will, will dress like the man and, and to do the role of the man in, in the quadrille mm -hmm. dance. I, I have seen it. So women, we, we, if we really pay attention to history, women are the ones who basically support the continuation of culture, the continuation of tradition, um, a lot of way by teaching the children, teaching the youth. That is not to say men don't do it, but my focus here is specifically bring into the foreground women. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I'm, and a, I'm a female. Gander, who else would I, who else would I? Who else would you represent? <laughs> exactly. yeah. yeah, I agree with you. Yes, and in Guyana, we, at least some years back, um, the East Indian women will wear a head tie that they call a romal, mm -hmm. which is not as flamboyant as the, as the French Caribbean ones, but it would use either a white fabric or the same madrasi kind of fabric. We call it madrasi romal. Right, and, yeah. and the head the headdresses here are specific. We have people who are very much knowledgeable about madras and the specific kind of headwear for depending on yeah. your marital status, whether you're single, divorced, yeah. or or never yeah. been married. Um, there's specific ways that they're tied and and created. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. Well, we can't talk a long time more, but. Um, let us see if there are any questions. Uh, the audience might have some questions for you. So could we have the questions coming up, please? Uh, OK. <clears throat> so this is the first question from author girl 144 So she says, I love the initiative you took with the Take 5 project during lockdown. Would you consider opening the series up to other islands in the future in addition to highlighting USVI practitioners? Oh, yeah, absolutely, because I think we are so isolated here. I mean, we're not part of CARICOM, but we are Caribbean island. Some things that, that some advantages that, you know, CARICOM islands have, we don't have, we can't participate, and, and some things, because even the United States thinks we're international. I think if we come together as Caribbean nations, Caribbean people, that's fine. I'm all about promoting the arts. I make no money from this. It is not. A, it wasn't about that. And I'm about promoting art and artists. Like just, I have, I have two loves in my life. Like you know, not you know, not not counting family members and stuff. And it's God and art. Like that's it, right? So, yeah, I will support artists wherever, however. Great, again. great. That's a great initiative. Yes. Okay. Do we have another question? Yes, this is from Annalie. She says, I am inspired by a hybrid practice as an artist, educator, and activist, provoked because of the limited arts infrastructure. How do you balance these various commitments? So I have summers off, and I work in the summers a lot. It doesn't always translate into working time, but I do. I work on weekends. When I was younger, I could I would stay up sometimes two or three o'clock in the morning to work, but I found as I got older, I could not manage the morning, and it would take me three four days to to kind of get myself back together after staying up that late. So I work I try to get work done on weekends a lot, and also I actually have worked in the classroom. I have I actually have a piece uh, a mosaic of the the Venus on the half shell from from the birth of Venus. Uh, by Botticelli that I did this mosaic and I had my student help me with the mosaic. Uh, and for this, for this project, I sent in, 
an image of a, a paper bag dress that was a madras paper bag dress but i had done a previous dress before where i helped the students helped me create the the mud cloth pattern of africa on paper bag and so that is how I do it. Sometimes I'll work in a classroom. If I'm starting some work and I need a collage base, my students will work with me on it. So I do create some collaboration that way with the students, you know, as we talked about it earlier. That great, helps. yes. Good. My neighbors Thank have you. helped me too. <laughs> oh, great, great. <laughs> I bring everybody in there. Good. So is there, yes, this is from BIM Vibes. 2020 has been a very challenging year for creatives. How have you been coping? It's a, it's a really relevant question. And, and, and you know, I know COVID has been horrid to so many people, but the opportunity to be home has been so positive for me. I was able to finish two works that I started, one since last year and one I started in January, and to do an entire series of almost 20 pieces because I was isolated at home. So I had daytime. I couldn't go to work, you know, and, and, and also if I went to work, even, you know, I work online, but I'm not putting out the same physical energy online as I would put in the classroom. And it's easier. I'm, I'm no longer out there. So I'm not running out to the stores and taking up time to go and do errands before I get home and you get home and it's dinner because I have children and and next thing you know, it's 10 o'clock and you haven't been in the studio. But here, I could just get off my computer when class is over, walk into my studio, and I'm, I can work. So for me, it's been a blessing. And I am, uh, I'm really hurting for the people who are negatively, ne negatively affected by COVID. But being able to be home for me has been a very positive thing. Great. Very good. Great. Yes. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Okay. So here is one from Catherine. Thank you for being so open about your life and work near us. The connections between art practice, pedagogy, and mental slash physical health are powerful. Have you also explored art therapy? I actually went to get my master's with the intention to do art therapy, but I realized that I really wanted to teach art production and, and engagement in the process of art um, more consciously. I didn't really want to evaluate somebody's sense of self or sense of reality uh, through the art, which is what I saw it to be at the time, um, possibly naively and, and, and wrong, but that's how I saw it when I went to study. I did work with special populations. I did some art therapy stuff. For me, art is therapeutic Specific. I, I will, if I need to create some art for cathartic reasons, I will do that for myself. But I think art is therapy, regardless of whether or not you approach it directly as therapy. A lot of times, one of the reasons the arts don't get support, especially in education, is there's no empirical data that shows what it does. But you, as the teacher, you as the educator, you can see what it does. I've had students come back to me year after year after year, like I told you, Ali. When I get discouraged that I'm not doing anything, what am I doing this for? Nobody cares. Right at that moment, somebody will text me or a student will say something to me like, thank you for teaching this to me. I, this is what, this really helped me. Or I had a student who I taught 20 some years ago who stopped and said, hey, this is what I did. I want to show you what I did for my daughter and my girlfriend. And she thought it was really great. And they're excited and they remember me. And I think that therapy <laughs> makes them feel good. But as yes. far as like, you know, clinical therapy, I haven't really gone. I, I chose not to go that way. Okay. Yes. You mentioned uh, Botticelli just now. And you, you were telling me you had a fascination with Botticelli and Dali. Interesting. So is there before I know, we right? go, it's there like... any? Yes. Is there another question or we can talk about Dali? Okay, there is another question from Rachel Thomas Coaching. I find your energy very uplifting and positive, along with your views on the bright side of 2020. Do you consider yourself an optimist? Also, what attracts you to skulls? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think yeah. I'm a little goth. <laughs> That's a skull <laughs> thing. I, yeah. I could be, I have been. So that part never left me. 
Um, and I, again, I'm really fascinated with mortality and death. I, I'm terrified of, of like horror movies. So I'm like, like not into that, but I just love dead things. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> morbid and morbid. I like skulls. Morbid. I just I find them beautiful. Uh, they're a reminder. They're a reminder to me. I guess if I I never really thought about why I like them, but I think they're a reminder to me of of you know how temporal life is, and there's just something very mysterious about skulls. And um, as far as my optimism, that is a long time coming. I have had to learn to be optimistic about life and especially this past year to really focus on 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 being positive and optimistic it's, it's a consciousness i think that's important and, and 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 you have to be optimistic as a teacher when you're teaching students and always be encouraging you know mm -hmm. okay yes so any final question okay yes annalee is the art community across the USVI well integrated or are these quite separate communities? You know, it's, it's kind of difficult to, I would say there's challenges because of the, the separation of the, the, the island, right? So St. Thomas has its community and I think, I would venture to say they're a little bit do better, but one of the, you know, I don't, I can't speak specifically for St. Thomas. And I, I, for example, there's a, there's a gallery in St. John um, where my work, uh, I can send my work in. Um, as a, I will call her name Priscilla and, and, and Michael Knight, because I, Bajo, Bajo del Sol Gallery in, in St. John, who, who reached out to me and I can show my work there. So if we want to be integrated, we can, but for some reason we remain isolated. On St. Croix, you have different arts communities, you know, we have the communities that do the tourist art who do, who don't have a real consciousness about why they make art, they just draw and paint and without communicating much or even a care to delve into that. And, you know, it's, it's the typical iconic imagery. And then you have people like me who really want to not be pigeonholed into being a Caribbean artist and making coconut trees and, and ocean scenes all the time. That is not to say there's not something there. When I first started, that you know, came from college. That's what I did. Uh, but you have to grow and you have to move forward. Yes. I, I don't know. Well, near us. That. Yes. Yeah. Near us, I we could continue talking a long time. I think you are a very committed, a rich person. You're <laughs> you're a great artist, and I like the fact that you know the art is grounded in you. Um, it's not something that, that you do just as you see it to just put down something, but it's, it's part of your great creativity. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, I wish you the best in your work and the best of health. And I hope we can we can stay in touch with one another after this salon. Absolutely. Thank, thank the great. organizers. Yes, I thank the organizers for, for linking us together. And uh, members of the audience, um, Remember that the conversations continue today. So please remember to tune in again at 4 p.m. AST this afternoon when I'll be in discussion with Jamaican artist, Dennis Robinson. And to close today's salon, I'd like to once again, on behalf of everyone, send a huge thank you to the Catapult partners, including the American Friends of Jamaica, Kingston Creative, and Fresh Milk for making this amazing series of conversations and all of these linkages among Caribbean artists happen. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Bye -bye. Good afternoon, thank you.